Hi there, welcome back to IndyCare. Slightly funny angle there. Uh, I'm Gordon Ross, and today's uh, news, it is, uh, of course, now officially midsummer, and the silly season's really started, but in serious news, yesterday uh, we heard of the death of Winnie Ewing. Now, Winnie Ewing uh, is probably one of the most pivotal figures in the history of the SNP, and I suppose more importantly, more pivotal, I think, than probably any other politician from the 20th century, in fact, all the way through to the current uh, era that we live in. When Ewing was elected, I think in 1974, in the Hamilton by-election as the first female and the first uh, female SNP MP at Westminster. Now, this started the, uh, the rise of the popularity of the SNP through the 1970s into the 80s and continuing all the way up into the 21st century, where eventually um, Alex Salmon won his famous victory in 2011. But Winifred Ewing, or Winifred Ewing, uh, as she's known, has a much longer and more colourful history than just being an MP. She also um, was the person who opened the new, or I shouldn't say opened, actually, who reconvened the Scottish Parliament um, after the uh, referendum to establish a devolved administration in Edinburgh. And she was the one who conducted the very first uh, meeting of that uh, parliament since 1707. So she was there at a critical point in Scotland's history and was effectively the oldest member of that parliament at that time. Now when he died at the age of 93 she had a very long and full life but not only was she an MP, she also became a member of the European Parliament for the SNP and, result, and basically represented the interests of Scotland in the European Union for many, many years. And she was so well loved in the European Union that she was uh, eventually conferred an honour. If, if I remember correctly, she was um, she was called the Mother of Europe. This was a, an honour which the European Union conferred upon her. She's also popularly known as Madame Ecos, um, Madame Scotland as well. So she is a massive figure in the history of the Scottish struggle for independence. And she, she said she made an awful lot more friends in the European Union Parliament than she ever made in Westminster, where it was mostly political enemies. However, I think um, Winnie Ewing's death now marks the end of one phase of the SNP's um, history leading up to and including the most recent referendum on independence in 2014. And now we've faced with another change. Hamza Youssef has been reported in the press, particularly by the BBC, and I think the party that he leads as well. And the British media is characterising the situation that the SNP is in now as a conundrum. How do they get to independence now that the Supreme Court has ruled that Holyrood doesn't have the powers to hold it. Now, it's widely believed that the only real route left, and in fact the only democratic route that exists, in fact, is to use the general election for the purpose of establishing majority for independence. But according to the BBC, and this is the wonderful thing about the BBC's narrow focus on what they think the truth is, is that they think that um, even if there were a so-called de facto referendum and there was a majority of voters voted for independence through this election, that it doesn't automatically lead to independence because there's no mechanism to do that. Well, this is where I would disagree, and this is where the paradigm shift that I mentioned in the preamble to this program begins to emerge. Now, paradigm shift means a complete radical change in the way something is done. And it has to be that way in order to get the job done. Because the one thing that Scotland doesn't have at the moment is a, a means of empowering its parliament to actually provide this independence referendum. Now, it can have that, but it needs some powerful um, impetus and some powerful motivation from somewhere to get the politicians that we currently have, who have existed within the Westminster system all their lives, to step outside of that bubble, outside of that political prison, and look at another way forward. Now, the only other way forward is, as I've said so many hundreds of times in this program, for our popular sovereignty, that's the sovereignty of us as individuals, to be exercised in a way which empowers our existing politicians to hold a referendum. And that means the people of Scotland 
telling their parliamentarians in West in uh, in Edinburgh in Holyrood that we are giving them the power to hold a referendum. They're not giving them the power over the entire constitution, but we are empowering our parliament by our own constitutional sovereignty as Scots to take the action necessary to hold a referendum. And that means effectively throwing the entire devolution settlement in the bin, where it actually belongs anyway, since it's now no longer actually devolution, because we're now being controlled by London through their Internal Markets Act. So, um, what I was going to say is we, we need to actually give them that power. And the way to do that is through organisations such as Salvo. Salvo and other organisations are currently working on a way in which the people of Scotland can empower their politicians to hold a referendum perfectly lawfully, but not under UK rules. Because, let's face it, if you want to get out of the UK, you can't abide by their rules, because their rules are designed to prevent you escaping. All the while, the British state secretly knows that it's actually not supposed to do that because we still have our sovereignty and for the British state at any point to say that we don't have the sovereignty to hold a referendum would be to break the fundamental principle of the Treaty of Union itself. So they can't overtly say that, but at the same time they can manoeuvre around and create new legislation which gives that kind of impression. What we need to do is be very clear about what we tell our politicians we want them to do. And that means we have to tiptoe through a semantic minefield of meaning so that when we do ask our politicians, or in fact, when we tell them that we are giving them the power to hold a referendum via our popular sovereignty, this needs to be very clearly set out so that, A, everybody in Scotland understands what it means and that the politicians do what we want and do not continue to operate within the Westminster uh, restrictions that they are under at the moment. <clears throat> In other words, assuming that anything they do might be illegal, it's not illegal to exercise your right to self-determination. But we need to make sure that we empower, encourage, embolden and support our politicians so that they will provide that referendum. And that referendum would be a Scottish referendum. There would be no place for the English Electoral Commission or the English media or the British controlled media in that referendum. It would be tightly controlled. It would be equally balanced between the yes and the no campaigns. They would have equal opportunities um, to present uh, pro and con positions on TV, but they would be strictly limited. And we need to control that. However, these are details. But what I'm telling you here is that things are about to change. And they're about to change in a very, very big way. Because politicians like Hamza Yusuf is currently operating under British restrictions, as are all the politicians in Holyrood and most of the political commentators assuming this. So it's going to take a big ask to get them to believe that they can do this. But it can be done, and it can be done in a legal framework under international law in which the people of Scotland can make this request that their parliament will hold an independence referendum, the result of which will be binding under international law, nothing to do with English law, nothing to do with the Union at all, in fact, but simply expressing our will, uh, our settled will as a people, as a nation, about how we want our country to be governed in the future. So this is all coming. And this will mark a step change from what's gone before. The death of Winnie Ewing is strangely symbolic of this. The death of Winnie Ewing is the end of the first chapter of the march towards independence. The heavy lifting has been done, and it's now up to the people to carry the momentum of this to the end so that we actually get free from the Union, and we do it in a way which is recognised internationally by all major uh, international institutions and that is what we are faced with doing and there are many experts across Scotland at the moment involved in think tanks and little groups who are compiling how this is going to be done and the final result of that will be known later this summer in fact in not such a distant future as you might think so it's coming and 
I I'm just warning you now that something big is going to happen and it's not going to come from our politicians because with the best will in the world the SNP's um, summer uh, convention or independence convention which is coming up next week uh, is not able to make policy decisions it's, it's there to examine the possibilities which is fair enough it's a discussion forum for anyone interested in the subject of independence but it's then down to the SNP to decide what the strategy will be but at the end of this strategising, if the SNP does go for a de facto referendum, which is what most people expect, there isn't at that uh, decision point any um, compulsion to just simply uh, announce independence as soon as that vote is done and a numerical majority is achieved, because we know that London would reject that, and we also know that at that point there isn't any kind of a process at least not one that we've heard of, in which the politicians would move from having got the yes vote to the various steps and stages necessary to get us out of the union proper and announce our independence to the world. So there is a lot of work to be done on this. The thing is that the, politi the political parties, the SNP, the Greens and ALBA, are all waiting and ready to make this jump but they're waiting for the starting gun to be fired and only the population of Scotland can actually fire the starting pistol. We are the ones who have to instruct them to do this stuff in the first place. But we need to also be able to articulate the exact methodology that we want this to be done using. And there is a specified way of doing it, which I can't explain to you right now because um, A, it's not been fully worked out and B, it will be fully worked out very soon, and I don't want to queer the pitch. So it's coming for all that, as the song says. Winnie Ewing, having passed away now, is now a, in the pantheon of Scottish heroes and heroines. And I think she deserves a place in that pantheon. But now we're looking for a new hero, a new leader to step forward, to take this new step into this new paradigm where we start to exert and exercise our popular sovereignty, something which we have not done since 1707. And in fact, even in 1707, I doubt most of the population of Scotland were aware, actually, that they had popular sovereignty, or if they were, there was no means for them to exercise it. So it's coming. It's coming for all that, and it's not going to be long now. It's not going to be a long wait for this, and I think many of you will be surprised by what's being proposed. Anyway, I hope you'd be pleasantly surprised and support it. That's exactly what we are trying to do um, by doing this research and coming forward with this new methodology, not just for having a vote. We need to give our parliament the powers to hold an actual independence referendum because a de facto referendum would do one thing, which might be to empower our parliament to hold a referendum by which then all of the people of Scotland can vote on whether they want independence or not. Trying to do that with a de facto referendum is not likely to succeed because it's, um, it's too big a jump. It needs to be a vote to empower our parliament here in Edinburgh to take the final step and hold a referendum of our own in which all of the people get to vote in a free and fair ballot without any interference from our next door neighbours. Anyway, that's about it from me today. I hope you've enjoyed today's programme. So it's been a little bit cryptic and uh, I'm teasing you a little bit, but things are afoot. Great things are afoot. And the history of Scotland is about to pivot, I hope, on this summer. And this midsummer is the point at which we are going to rotate round and face in a new direction and actually get to independence by a very unexpected route when it comes to uh, the United Kingdom. They will find it very difficult to handle this because they don't understand it because it's not their political system. Anyway, that's it from me. I will see you again I hope, over the weekend. In the meantime, enjoy the weekend if you've got the nice weather. It's a bit kind of grey and, I don't know, a bit sort of muggy here, but at least it's dry. But I'll see you again on Sunday. Keep the faith. Bye for now.